Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm your host, Lisa. I'm here today with my co-host, Venkat. Uh, hey, Venkat. Um, and go. today we have a very special guest uh, who's able to join us, uh, Jordan O'Reilly. He's uh, the engineering lead at Jackbox Games, and he's going to be um, helping us with our conversation today about Git and source control. Uh, and maybe some games if we get into games. Sounds good. Uh, cool. So, uh, Vega, I know you had some some questions about source controller. Do you want to like kick us off? Uh, why don't we start with um, Jordan? Sort of uh, give us a little snapshot of your uh, career in software and g gaming so far, so yeah, we know sure. what questions to bug you with. Sure. Uh, so I am the engineering lead on the infrastructure team. So. We run, my team runs all of our multiplayer servers. Um, if people are not like really aware of what Jackbox games is, we make uh, Quiplash and Drawful and You Don't Know Jack, uh, Trivia Murder Party, a whole bunch of games. Every year we come out with a package of five games. And our kind of thing is that you play um, the games from your phone. So imagine it's like you're playing Pictionary, but instead of having paper, you're drawing from your phone and showing up on your television or played through your Xbox or your PC or whatever. Um, we're on like so many platforms, it's just totally absurd. Um, so my team manages the controllers and the multiplayer servers, uh, and I'm the like principal engineer on the, the, uh, the server aspect of it. Um, but I don't do any of the gameplay engineering. That's like a whole separate team. Then they have their own engineering lead, uh, who's our principal engineer. Uh, so. It's kind of interesting because we, the uh, the infrastructure team and the gameplay team, we use version control very differently. Um, and I'm working on an MFA in game design, and I use version control very differently in my, in my art school program than I do at work. So uh, there's a lot of different contexts in which we use version control, and they're all subtly different. Cool. Uh, do you want to go ahead and maybe like? Yeah, so I guess that's so. I guess I'm curious. Like, you're so you're doing an MFA in game design. Uh, right. How is what you use? Yeah, could you go ahead and maybe just like outline what the differences are, just generally? Like, that's all. So, 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 so I think um, we're starting from from a premise that everybody knows what the value proposition of version control is. <laughs> One of the things that's really funny when you work with artists is they're just like they're just like I don't care, dude. Just do it. You know, like, mm -hmm. like you have to convince it. Sometimes I have to convince artists that using version control at all is a useful thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I version like uh, I do 3D modeling with Blender. I'm very bad at 3D modeling, but I do 3D modeling in Blender and I'll version the blend files um, and then I'll have export scripts and I'll also version the exports uh, just because it makes things easier. Um, and it's like, it can be a little bit frustrating with Git because you have to use Git LFS, um, and trying to explain this to artists, how Git works and what Git LFS is, is very challenging, right? So, uh, I have to teach artists how to use Git. Um, right. So, okay. So like what, maybe we should, for our, our listeners, like explain what is like? What is get? What is version control? What is the value proposition of version control, Jordan? Um. <laughs> um, okay, so um, there are many things that uh, Git does, um, but from a high, from a high level, um, you can think about having something like track changes in Microsoft Word for every type of file. And the programs that manipulate these files are not aware that it's happening. So anything you've ever wanted to record the history of, you can do with version control. Mm -hmm. um, Git is the most widely used uh, version control system among people in the tech industry. It is not very widely used in the game industry. The game industry is basically, um, for, for the most part, most studios use Perforce. Um, which is a version control system that most people in the tech industry are not aware still exists. Um, most people in the tech industry think of Perforce only because they know that Google has a monorepo 
that was maintained in Perforce for years. Uh -huh. um, that's like the only context that a lot of people in the tech industry think about Perforce. But so uh, is the culture at least fully like 100% on version control at all? Like I remember back when I was actually in tech roles, um, this was in an R&D lab, half the engineers were still new to it and hated even joining any kind of version control. This was still subversion and CVS days and half the like chemists and physicists refused to put their code in version control. And then people had to like fight them and say, you got to start using this. What happens if you get hit by a bus kind of thing? So it was still, I would say in an R&D lab, it was like 50% adoption heading towards 75. So I would imagine graphic design and art communities are much worse or are um, they not? So, so the thing about Perforce is that Perforce is proprietary, whereas Git, uh, whereas Git is, uh, is open source, free as in beer, free as in speech. Um, Git has a lot of functionality that's really good for programmers, but for artists, um, artists actually don't want the distributed version control thing, and they do want to be able to lock files. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. So all of the things that people think that are major innovations that Git brought where, where they're like, you don't have to worry about file locking anymore. All of the artists are sitting in the other side of the room being like, wait, excuse me, but I want file locking. File locking is how I communicate with my peers, mm. right? And so there's this weird dichotomy where we manage our, we manage our games with Perforce because it's, it's what is uh, accommodating to artists. And then we manage all of our web stuff with Git because it's uh, more powerful for programmers. Um, yeah, maybe we should mention, maybe we should kind of like talk a little bit about like what it means to lock a file, right? So if you lock a yeah, file, sure. that means that no one else can also use that file. And it like, it's pretty obvious. It kind of like sends a signal mm -hmm. to everyone else that can access that same like system of files or set project files, right? Um, that someone else is working on it and that changes are coming to that file, right? Whereas yep like GitHub or the way that Git works, like you said, it's distributed. So everyone has a copy of the files and anyone can change them. And then at some point you have to take all these changes and you merge them all back into like the common whatever. Um, and for programmers, that's great because two different people can be working on the same file. And then it's, sometimes it's really stick, like sticky and hairy to like take two sets of changes and put them all together again into like one big like change set, right? Or one big file document that you've changed, but like usually you can kind of figure it out or maybe you're working on different parts of the file and it's fine, you just merge it together. But I'm gonna guess that like things like um, art, art artifacts tend to be like really hard to merge together. Um, but maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's not quite the same. It depends. You know, if you have, if you have, if you have a piece of code mm -hmm. and I edit one part of the file and you edit another part of the file, um, merging, that can be done automatically. Um, but if we have two images uh, and you edit one part of the image and I edit one part of the image, if we merge those, is that going to produce an image that is useful? Right. Um, sometimes yes, but oftentimes no. And it's, it's oftentimes easier to just be like, just one person updated at a time. We have lots of work to do. This file's locked, go do another task, right? But, but wait, the same argument that applies to code applies to uh, images or graphic models as well, right? Like suppose you and I are working on two different 3D models that need to like uh, mesh. So you're working on some part that's maybe like a, uh, a car and I'm working on like a wheel and the two have to come together. So if you and I change it <laughs> incompatibly, and I mean, that was the reason that was explained to me when I first was introduced to version control. It's like locking yeah. is a false sense of security. And just because a file is locked doesn't mean you can, uh, you're going to avoid incompatible changes because uh, pieces have to fit together beyond the lock level, right? So that sure. argument seems to apply to like 3D model files, at least, which are just like codes of transformations. Sure. Um, it's, it's funny, you very quickly get into the real nitty gritty, right? Because... <laughs> Um, like if you're modeling something in Blender, uh, and you have a single mesh and we both make changes to that mesh, there's probably not, uh, there's probably not a unified view of the mesh that is something that is actually useful. But if you have a, a blend file that has many objects in it 
and it's you can have you can have a blend file that links in other blend files so that when you change a mesh in one file, it updates the reference meshes in all of the other scenes. Um, that those could be merged very successfully. So it's really hard. Uh, it's really hard with art assets to be able to make the same judgments. Uh, so a lot of times, people what people will do is they'll just lock files that they're not editing to make sure that other people can't edit them. <laughs> right. Okay. So you you use fi you manually lock files to protect invariants. Mm. That's cool. So the yeah. extreme version of that, if you have a very complicated scene, is to lock everything to work on one thing. <laughs> right. You completely like. So so it. it's it's funny. Different different teams have different uh, strategies, and it it could even change uh, based on the game engine. Um, a really, really, so like uh, Unity is a really widely used game engine. It is the most widely used game engine by indie game developers. Um, some people probably would want to fight me about that. Um, it is common on teams for different team members to have their own scenes. So you would just edit your own scene. Um, and then for there to be like a, uh, the kind of like a master scene that represents the master copy um, that is like the final version to go into a game. Um, that's one workflow. That's a common workflow among really small teams. I've never worked in AAA, so I don't even know what AAA studios do. <laughs> you know, like I've never worked on, uh, I, all my, all the games that I've worked on have been like four or five people. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I think like, so this kind of brings up an interesting point, Jordan, where you're saying like you're trying to get artists to like use version control or like trying to sell them on the value proposition of version control. But yeah. I think there's an interesting thing about like version control is really useful, especially useful when you're working with more than one person, right? So like when it's like the, the output or product is like multiple people's work. And so you're trying to like all kind of collaborate together on the same thing. So it's like really good collaborative software. Um, uh, but like for like art projects and stuff, like are the artists that you're like trying to get on version control, are those like also multi-person collaborative projects? Or is it like, are you like, are you, would you like recommend that even like solo artists like also look into like using version control for their stuff? Yes. I, so I do in my MFA program, we do a lot of solo projects and I version all my solo projects. Um, and one of the reasons that I version all of my solo projects is that I often make changes that I regret. Um, and so I want to go back into the history to get back the uh, like old versions of the file. Um, most art programs, the undo history will not be saved along with the file. And if the undo history is saved, the undo history uh, is typically limited in length. Um, it can be very easy to trash your undo history. Um, so th the other thing is like, you may not know how far in the undo history you have to go. So um, a really good example of this uh, is this is this is a thing that I that I um, that like was really helpful for me uh, for versioning 3D models is I was working on this game where I had a model of a zombie and it was a really uh, a low poly model. It was a model that had um, not many points in the mesh, uh, not many, not many polygons. Um, and that was like a rough model. Um, and then I learned how to use Blender sculpt tool that like turns everything into clay and you can like make really smooth things. And I made my zombie look freaking great. And it looked beautiful. I put it in my game. And then when I tried to shoot the zombie, the mesh was too detailed for doing collisions. It was making the game really slow. Because doing collision detection is, uh, there's a lot of CPU work in doing collision detection. So typically in a game, you would have a 3D model representing how you render something, the visual representation of something, and then you have a separate 3D model, which has fewer polygons, which is its actual shape in the game world and what it collides with. And so what I needed to do was I needed to go into the history of that model and find the older low poly version and then just copy it out and paste it into the current version so that I'd have both meshes because that was faster than taking what I had and creating a new mesh around it. Mm -hmm. I could have done that, but I'm, I have very poor skills with Blender, mm -hmm. but I have very good skills with Git. So I was like, I'll just get the old low poly mesh out of, out of the Git history 
And it was like, I solved in two minutes with Git something that probably would have taken me another hour or so with Blender. That's cool. Hmm. It's interesting. So like, okay, so like, so you're talking about like undo history, right? Like saving your work kind of thing. Uh, but when you use like a separate version control, it seems like undo history is usually embedded in whatever software you're using. So you hit on, so like as you do actions, the software itself is remembering the actions you've taken. And then if you decide to undo them, it can like roll them back and unapply them. Um, however, usually like at least my experience with like Git is that you have to like consciously make checkpoints. It's kind of like in, yeah. I feel like like in Pokemon, you had to like go do the save points at like little health clinics if you wanted to have like points to go back to. And I guess that's like most video games, right? Like you have to consciously and cognizantly recognize that this is a point that you want to like create a checkpoint at. Um, so in some ways, like using version control software, at least the kind that you have to like consciously checkpoint yourself at is kind of it's kind of like playing a video game, except the game is like this work product that you're doing. Um, sure. I don't know, I think that's weird. Definitely. The new angle you're... is the social angle though, right? Like playing a game versus playing software or design development with a team. Um, I guess there's an element of like social gameplay here as well, like merge conflicts are gameplay, would you say? <laughs> like does the analogy run through the social side as well? Um, oh, go ahead, yeah. I mean, I, so, so like what I, what I was thinking about when Lisa was talking about going through the, un, the, the undo history and like what you have in games is um, if I'm playing an adventure game and I see like, say I'm playing like a fantasy adventure game and I see like a pack of dragons or something and I'm like, there's no way I can fight those. Mm. I'm going to save the game and I'm going to jump down and, and go crazy and like try to fight them and know that I'm going to die and be like, oh, I died. All right, I'll load my game. Right. <laughs> and that's like, that's a similar thing that you can do with version control. You could be like, all right, save the current state of the project, save all, you know, like commit to, the, to version control, the state of all of the files, and now change a whole bunch of things and, you know, try it out, play through it, and then, and then be like, no, I don't like that, trash it. Or I have, I have actually used Git branches where I modified a game in a branch and then what I would do is I would just check out a branch and then hit play. And then I'd check out another branch and hit play. And so I would just show my group mates, be like, well, what if the level looked like this? What if the level looked like this? And you can show variations that way um, instead of having to create many different scenes or many different files. Um, and so like the ability to try out variations is something that artists actually make a lot of use of. Um, but they tend to do things in a very ad hoc and uh, like art specific way. So um, like at Jackbox, we do a lot of our artists 2D um, and people might use layers and toggle layers on and off to try out different variations. Um, but you can do the same thing with any art package uh, using Git or Perforce. Okay. Huh. Or so do uh, programmers do this as well? Like what you're describing is like regular version control. The main use case is like you know saving a history of your work, and what you're describing is sort of a what if uh, simulation tool to explore different possibilities, right? And you know, do programmers do this as well, or is it a behavior only you've only seen in artists and designers? I do it all the time. I don't know, do, you <laughs> not, do you not do that, Lisa? I mean, I definitely use branches for stuff, yeah. I mean, I like, I like, I'll like start working on something and put it in a branch and then come back to it later, I guess. Yeah. I don't know if I use it so much as like, I feel like, uh, I feel like there's like a little bit of a different in terms of like play exploration, in terms of like, like, I feel like when I'm doing like arty things or like trying different colors and stuff, like it's a little bit easier to like want to try different variations, whereas like, when I'm programming stuff, at least these days, I usually like have a decent idea about how I want to do it. I guess, I guess I don't, I guess I do more like try and figure out how I do it before I start working on it kind of thing. But I think it's a little more possible to do that with software than it is with like visual art. Yeah. Venkat, like, have you used version control? Like, what's your experience with version control here? So uh, I just looked at my, my GitHub profile, profile and, and I'm embarrassed to admit that 
I have like eight check-ins in the last year. So I've like touched it eight times. So like you guys probably do that like uh, in a single day or something. Uh, so yeah, I haven't used version control much, but my history with it interestingly is long, but very empty. Like back in 94, when I was a sophomore, I got like a unpaid internship at a computer science lab. And they wanted me to port an ancient version control system called RCS to replace an even more ancient version control system called uh, SCCS. So a revision control system and source code control system. See, these are like 90s vintage Unix uh, uh, version control things. And that was my first exposure. I totally failed at that project. Then 10 years later, uh, I was briefly using subversion. I hated that. And I became one of those horrible people who refuses to use version control. And finally, by the time I had quit technical work, uh, sometime around 20, uh, 2011 and stuff, it finally became low pressure enough that I started using GitHub for at least my hobby projects. So when it stopped mattering, that's when I actually started using it a little bit. But yeah, GitHub is like seeing the trajectory, even though I have not used any of them very much, I can see like the clear increase in sophistication and like capability. And GitHub is fundamentally like much less of a painful mess to use than say Subversion and Subversion in turn was like much less of a painful mess than the ancient Unix style ones. So I think the technology has improved over the last 20 years. So from, from as a spectator, uh, I don't know if you guys uh, have used other systems. I think I've used Microsoft Team something. Team, team Foundation, Foundation Server. Yep. Team Foundation Server. That's so. Oh wild. yeah, I use TFS. It sucks. Yeah, I don't actually remember. I don't actually remember anything. <laughs> is yeah, Visual no. Source Safe a separate product or is that the same product? I, I also use Visual Source Safe. Yeah. I was an ASP.NET developer. That was like my first job out of college. Yeah. And different same. different clients would have different uh, like version control setups. So you would have like some clients would, be, would have their own subversion server. Some clients would like use our subversion server. Uh, then some people had a TFS server. Some people had a, a visual source safe server. A lot of people just had a directory that you'd FTP into. And so you, we'd have our own version control set up so that because they like didn't want version control, but we were like, that's totally reckless. So like I'd be version and controlling, version controlling their stuff on the side so that I wouldn't like blow up client projects, but then do everything with FTP by hand. So, yeah. Versus like, I, uh, cause you wanted, you wanted to keep the, so like in software, it's really important to keep the version history because like if something goes wrong or like if your files go down or if your server like disappears, um, in theory, you can like back it up or like roll back to like the last known good state. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, to like recover from errors a lot faster because you've got like the last good working copy somewhere. Um, yeah, I don't know. Have you have oh, you, you ever? Guys... Oh, go ahead. Have you ever used version control without internet access in a group setting? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think so. I mean, I've done the whole like. Uh save versions of a shared project on a floppy disk or something and like yeah and so. physical media uh, off so i've done that with like ancient team projects in college or something but rare okay so there's so um all right so so in the tech industry we have hackathons in the game industry we have game jams they're similar except game jams don't typically have prizes it's more like a jam session like with music um there is a game jam that happens every year called Train Jam, which is a game jam on a train where you make a video game on a train on the way to GDC, um, the Game Developers Convention. This is very similar to the startup bus, which is you make a startup on a bus on the way to uh, South by Southwest. I've done both of these things, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the deal with Train Jam is that you do not have internet access for like 20 hours straight because you, you are riding a, um, uh, what is it? The California Zephyr, which is like a sightseeing train. Um, and so everybody has a video game where they're doing their version control on a thumbstick. And so you have somebody like, like with a Git repo and a thumbstick and you're like plug it into your laptop and you're like, okay, I've like, I've like put my stuff on the thumbstick. All right. I pulled myself on. <laughs> and you have like, and, and there's like, there's, 
exactly like the trains totally sold out so there'll be people in different cars so you were like going between cars like exchanging stuff it's crazy um and then i have i have this which is a raspberry pi that uh, i set up to be a wi-fi network so everybody's throwing thumbsticks around and i've got the one group where i'm like where I'm like, yeah, I set up a Git server on my Raspberry <laughs> Pi, like connect to this. And I had like an IRC server and like all the game developers were like, what the hell is IRC, dude? Uh, <laughs> um, seriously? Holy shit, really? Wait, wow. game devs don't use IRC? How? No, IRC is not. Um, I mean, I'm sure it, it, it depends. It depends on the community. Um, like yeah. people like the people that, typically people that go to game jams and hackathons are, I don't want this to sound inflammatory, but that's more of an amateur thing because it's more of a thing when you're trying to establish yourself. Um, I've done loads of uh, of hackathons, so I, I don't want anybody to think that that's like something I look down upon. I actually met my wife at a hackathon, but anyway, um, a lot of those communities are like most of their skills are probably five years old or less. Um, there'll be a handful of people that have been around for longer. Um, but like probably more than half of the participants have only been in the industry for five years or less. I mean, I've only been in the game industry for four years now, so I am, I am technically a new game developer. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I definitely only did hackathons the first couple of years of trying to learn how to write code. But yeah. speaking of ama yeah. uh, amateurs, if you go f even further down the amateur to like pure consumers, like there is a version, like you mentioned, um, track changes in Microsoft Word and things like that. So there is a kind of like almost invisible version control that even consumer software uh, people use. Like uh, I think Dropbox has some sort of version control going on in the background. I kind of use it without like regard to it. Um, uh, but is there like um, something irreducibly complex about like creative work that makes version control like a conscious thing that you have to think about and interact with other people on like why can't version control become like consumer grade transparent invisible in the background it just happens or is that a stupid question no it's a good question um i don't think i don't think that resolving conflicts is something we know how to automate yet <laughs> Like, are, you, are we still talking about software, Jordan, or is this like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. You know, it's like, I think, I think most people don't even really, I think most consumers, the equivalent of that is to not have versions. Mm. For most people, the equivalent of that is to just use Google Docs. Because the reality is, like, it, the vast majority of the time, most people, most of the time, they don't care about old versions. They just care about the current version, right? And one of the things that's so wild to me about version control is that version control is a like distribution problem for most users. For most users, it's just get the current version. But none of the version control systems are hooked up with content delivery networks. I just like, this is just like so baffling to me. Like why? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, it's a great question. Uh... Yeah, so it's kind of like if there was like the Git like front, not front end, but like the Git content delivery. Well, that's where GitHub is, right? Like to some extent, like GitHub is like the content delivery network for Git. Um, sure. I mean, yes, I, 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 was, I, I like, <laughs> I've just it, like increasingly found myself not enjoying Git. Um, <laughs> I. I, so I, I read the O'Reilly book on Git, like cover to cover, like on the train when I was like, you know, just out of college and I was like trying to prove myself in tech industry. And it was the most boring thing I've ever read in my whole life. And it was also one of the most useful things I've ever read in my whole life. It's just like, it's just, there's so much good stuff in there. Um, but the thing that I've like started to come to understand about Git and about GitHub is that Git is optimized for this problem that Linus Torvalds has that nobody else has, right? And this problem is, okay, I want st random strangers to email me uh, changes to a huge software project that I can apply at, at my own leisure at any order 
by looking at my inbox and be like, I'll do that one. Look at my inbox, I'll do that one. It doesn't matter the order. It doesn't matter where they come from. So basically, Linus created the system that was designed for drive-by contributions, which is exactly what Git has enabled with the pull request because it's like, the other day, I had a pull request on my own personal dot files. And I'm like, dude, this is not, <laughs> these are just my preferences. Like, why are you, <laughs> why are you telling me to change my preferences? Like, this is not okay. You know? Cause you're doing it wrong, Jordan, clearly. Like, could be better, I don't know. Who was it from? Was it a friend? Was it your wife? No, it was a random dude on the internet. I never, he was like a student. And it was totally, it was like, it was like totally innocent. Is um, this like the reply guy version of like, like the Twitter reply guy, <laughs> but on like GitHub? No, I mean, I think, I think, I think this is like what, what a generation of developers is being told is uh, acceptable decorum. You know, because like a lot of times uh, in, in, in open source projects, somebody will ask a question and the question will be like, can you add this feature? And a maintainer will reply something like, pull requests welcome, smiley face emoji, which is, you know, polite open source speak for like, do it yourself, right? So now there's a lot of people, well, knowing that this will happen, will be like, okay, I want this feature. So I will start the conversation with a pull request. <laughs> right? Yeah, I do that. So we, I do that a lot, yeah. Yeah, so we've, we've created a culture of drive-by contributions. Okay, so what happens when you receive one of these? Right, when you receive one of these, you look at it and you think, well, that's a terrible idea. But the person, <laughs> but the person went through all the work. It would be rude not to merge it. You know, like, like it, it's not always, you know, it, it certainly depends on, it certainly depends on the work, right? But yeah. there is like, a person puts in a certain amount of work that creates a sort of social pressure for the person on the receiving end to receive it with grace. Yep. Whereas if they had had a conversation up, for, up front and said, hey, can you add me so that I can like send you or that so that I can contribute, you know, you might have a conversation in advance about what the contribution is going to be. Um, yeah. So, yeah. But I think your point, Lisa, about it being like reply guy behavior on with code is actually on point. That's what this mm -hmm. is. And you can sort of extend the analogy to say like, just as there's reply guy behavior, there's also like concern trolling behavior. Like maybe it's like somebody who's actively hostile to your project and is coming up with a, f a feature to like tank it and is like pretending it's like a concerned contribution, right? I, I can see that happening, right? Um, there's probably such things as hostile contributions to uh, projects, like even open source projects, which welcome pull requests as opposed to like personal dot files. There's probably things that would be considered hostile contributions, but done under the polite guise of contribution. Hostile contributions. I like, I like yeah. Get in power, Yeah. yeah. Oh. I want to share um, a story I just read yesterday. So I was finishing up uh, Ian Banks' culture novel. Do you guys read Ian M. Banks? So a sci-fi writer who has like this big space opera stuff. And uh, he, he's famous for like, so his world has uh, spaceships and the spaceships are run by AI minds and humans live within them. And all of them basically have version controlled uh, brains. And there's this whole story. So I just wanted to share my version control story from sci-fi. So there's a spacecraft that goes off uh, to fight a major war. And it, of course, backs up a copy of itself um, before it heads into the engagement, just like you do when you're about to fight dragons. So it like saves a copy of itself. And then it gets like blown apart. And to escape the enemies, it like leaves the galaxy on like an escape trajectory. And then its friend spaceships decide that, all right, that spaceship is dead. So we are going to restore the backed up copy in a new spaceship body. And this new spaceship body goes and continues the war. But at some point, the old spaceship comes back. And now there's two spaceships with the same personality, but different memories of the war. And they go into the final war. And the subplot ends with they're both involved in the final battle of the war. And they both like keep copies of their different branches on each other's brains. And they come to an agreement that 
this is a bad war. One of us is likely to get killed and the other person will merge the changes and become the canonical version of the spacecraft mind. So yeah, that's what ends up paradox. <laughs> This is, yeah, time travel, multiple worlds, multiple personalities. So yeah, it can get funny. Yeah, I, I'm hoping to see that kind of feature in Git at some point. That'll be fun. Upload your brain, fork it, version control it. Somebody does a pull request to your brain. You just have to figure out how to write it in the right file format, I think is the real, that's, I mean, that's really what's standing between you and this reality, Venkat, is the, it's a file tweets, format. Tweets wow. are the right file format. Like uh, <laughs> somebody actually uh, took all my tweets and this is not GPT-3, but like two or three versions of AI before and they digested my tweets and it actually did a pretty creditable job of like tweeting like I do. So it's possible. Oh, and, and now if you do, you guys follow Drill on Twitter, D R D R I L. Oh yeah. So there's Drill GPT two as well, and I can't tell them apart anymore. Like yeah. Drill and Drill GPT two, tweet roughly the same way. There was a. Uh, yeah, we had we we had a room full of bots at Etsy of old employees. Then the bots would talk to one another. It was really weird to watch. Uh, so sci -fi feature. What? <laughs> I don't know how much you should say about this, but <laughs> <laughs> people people made bots of people as they left, uh, and so there was a channel full of bots of people of like people that had departed, and they would all talk to one another. This went on for like a couple of weeks, and then it had to be shut down because it was too weird. <laughs> Wait, was this after um, one of you left? So was there ever a bot of either of you? Uh, <laughs> I, it was shut down before I left, oh, okay. so, yeah, I know. <sighs> yeah, cool. all right, all right, well, I think that's about, I think we're definitely over time, but this is super fun, Jordan, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your, uh, version control, uh, stories and wisdom, this is great. I didn't even uh, talk about BitKeeper, so, you got this, <laughs> you got, uh, you got the abridged version. Yeah, yeah. Is there like, um, so is there like any any way we can send listeners to check out your stuff? Or is there anything you'd want to like have people go take a look at? What's your SoundCloud, Jordan? Um, <laughs> um, my Twitter is just my name, which is at Jordan O'Reilly, O-R-E-L-L-I. Um, and then the games I work on, uh, you can find at jackboxgames.com or you can uh, find them on Steam. Uh, the Jackbox Party Pack 7 just came out uh, recently. It's a good uh, holiday fun. Our biggest night of the year is New Year's Eve. So um, a lot of people like to play our games on, on New Year's Eve, and then they turn them off when Ryan Seacrest comes on TV. Um, <laughs> but you can also play them on Zoom. So you know, now's a good time of year to play our games on Zoom. Um, All right. Yeah. Hey jackboxgames.com and Jordan O'Reilly on Twitter. So real pleasure to meet you, Jordan. You too. Thanks well, for having me, guys. All right, great. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, talk to you later. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>